Good evening, Lighthouse friends. We're going to try this again here this week. Uh, I felt uh, good about last week's approach uh, where I just sit here in my um, reading chair in my house and um, no editing, just talk to you from my notes, from my heart, and uh, and hopefully uh, it's encouraging to you. Um, if you don't remember, if you haven't had a chance to watch it yet, uh, we've been talking about the life of Joseph from the Old Testament in the Bible in the book of Genesis. And uh, I would invite you to get your Bible if you have one. Uh, if you don't, let me know. We'll get you one. But if you've uh, got a Bible, I'd encourage you to read the story on your own. Last week we talked about uh, the beginning of Joseph's story in Genesis 37. Uh, just to review, uh, super quickly, Joseph uh, was a young boy. Uh, the story starts, he's around 16 or 17, and he's hated by his brothers. They're very jealous of him and uh, ended up uh, wanting to kill him. And they threw him in a deep well to die. Um, uh, the story uh, goes on from there in Genesis 37. We didn't talk about this last week, but uh, again, the short version is that uh, while his brothers were uh, eating lunch and talking, some uh, traveling merchants traveling merchants came by, and uh, they decided to sell Joseph as a slave to them. Then they killed a goat and dipped Joseph's coat in it in the blood, took it back to their father and said that they found it. So they convinced their father that their youngest brother Joseph had been killed by a wild animal and devoured, and then they sold him as a slave. These merchants then traveled on to Egypt and sold Joseph to a man named Potiphar, who was an official of Pharaoh. Uh, then there's kind of a totally different story that happens in Genesis 38, and Joseph, uh, his story picks up again in Genesis 39. And so I'm going to uh, just read the first five verses of Genesis 39 to start this story uh, for this week. And uh, tonight I'm going to be reading from the message version of the Bible. It's one that I read often, um, and I would encourage you, if you're having trouble understanding the Bible, uh, to read the message version. You can find that online as well for free. Um, so I'm going to read Genesis 39, verses 1 through 5, and it says, After Joseph had been taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelites, Potiphar, an Egyptian, one of Pharaoh's officials, and the manager of his household, bought him from them. As it turned out, God was with Joseph, and things went very well with him. He ended up living in the home of his Egyptian master. His master recognized that God was with him, saw that God was working for good in everything that he did, and he became very fond of Joseph and made him his personal aid. He put him in charge of all of his personal affairs, turning everything over to him. From that moment on, God blessed the home of the Egyptian, all because of Joseph. The blessing of God spread over everything that he owned, at home and in the fields, and all Potiphar had to, had to concern himself was eating three meals a day. Okay, wow. Um, that, that sounds pretty good, but I want you to imagine what this must have been like for Joseph. 17 years old, almost killed by his brothers, then sold as a slave, now living in Egypt as the uh, full-time personal assistant to this man named Potiphar. Uh, no connection back to his family. Um, was the baby of the family... And so, you know, he's got to be missing his family, especially his father. He's probably convinced that, he, that his father believes that he is dead. I'm, I'm curious, how would you respond to this level of unfairness? Um, you know, wouldn't this be the ideal scenario to just give up? Um, to stop trying your best, to find some way to just numb yourself to life, yet... As we read the story of Joseph, we find that he didn't do that. In spite of being sold as a slave, he still did his best to honor God in the midst of his circumstances. And we read the result of that throughout these verses. I don't know if you noticed this, but multiple times in just those first five verses, it says, God was with Joseph. Uh, 
It says that in verse 2. It says in verse 3, God was with him. God was working for good in everything he did. Um, And so we see just in the beginning of this part of the story in Genesis 39, the uh, great value in honoring God in spite of your circumstances. In fact, it reminds me of a passage in the New Testament that I'm going to try to quickly find. I don't know that I'm very good at navigating quickly in my Bible here on my iPad. Um, (laughs) John 15, um, where Jesus is talking about uh, giving, he's giving us an example, trying to paint a picture of what it really means to have a relationship with him. In in, uh, John 15, verses 5 through 8, Jesus said, uh, he said, think of it this way, I am the vine and you are the branches. When you are joined with me and I with you, the relationship intimate and organic, the harvest is going to be abundant. In, In other words, there's going to be a lot of fruit separated from me you can't produce a thing anyone who separates from me is like dead wood that's just gathered up and and thrown on the bonfire but if you make yourself at home with me and my words are at home in you you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon wow that's a promise from jesus in the new testament to us of what the result in our life will be if we are if we are connected to him like the vine uh, and the branches are connected in a grapevine. This story of Joseph um, is a parallel to this uh, explanation that Jesus gives. And let me remind you that Joseph was 17 when this happened. And so uh, I know many of you are uh, in high school. Some of you listening are still in middle school, but, but you're teenagers as well. And And this same level of uh, blessing and commitment um, in a relationship with Jesus Christ and his Father, um, you can have that as well. So um, let's go back to Genesis chapter 39. Uh, Hopefully by the end of uh, this video lesson season, I'll be an expert at navigating on my iPad. Normally I read my Bible, uh, my paper Bible, um, But I honestly thought it would be quicker if I used the iPad, but that is not the case. So uh, back to Genesis 39. Uh, So here we are. Uh, Potiphar loves Joseph, has basically turned everything over to him. And all Potiphar has to do is worry about what he's going to eat for his next meal. So let's pick it up in uh, the middle of verse 6 there. It says, Joseph was a strikingly handsome man. And as time went on, his master's wife became infatuated with Joseph. And one day, she said, sleep with me. He wouldn't do it. He said to his master's wife, look with me here. My master doesn't give a second thought to anything that goes on here. He puts me in charge of everything that he owns. He treats me as an equal. The only thing that he hasn't turned over to me is you. You're his wife, after all. How could I violate his trust and sin against God? She pestered him day after day, but he stood his ground. He refused to go to bed with her. Wow. (laughs) Remember last week I said this story could be right out of a Netflix movie that we would watch today? What would this look like today? Potiphar's wife secretly passes the key to the best room in the hotel uh, that uh, Joseph's working in and says, meet me there at nine for the night of your life. You know, he's probably in his early 20s by now, um, he was sold as a slave at 17 and, and had to learn the culture, the language. You know, when he first was bought by Potiphar, uh, Potiphar didn't trust him immediately. It took some time for that to be earned. Um, and so now he's probably in his early 20s, close to turning 21. I bet he could thought, he, he probably could have thought a lot of reasons, a lot of justifications for saying yes to Potiphar's wife. His loyalty, his commitment, his devotion, though, his worship was not of himself. Unfortunately, today, we mostly worship ourselves. Um, Yet, Joseph was able to resist temptation because of what he valued and worshipped, because what he valued and worshipped most 
was not himself, it was God. You know, I, I doubt that we would actually see a Netflix movie with this kind of outcome. A single man turns down an offer of a night of passion with a beautiful woman. Unfortunately, um, most movies and shows we watch now are just the opposite. Uh, sex between consenting, not married adults is normal, accepted, and, and probably most of the time expected. But... Kids, friends, please listen. I have personally talked with, counseled, walked with people over the years who have said yes to those kinds of temptations. And that choice has radically, radically affected the rest of their lives and changed the lives of their spouses and their children's. Whether you are married or single, um, the result of not following God's design for sexual intimacy and relationships is the same. It results in heartache and pain. And the answer, whether you're married or single, is the same. If you want God's blessing, if you want his presence, you've got to choose to do what pleases God. You know, I found uh, many times in my life where I've been presented with... uh, similar things. Um, I've traveled a lot in my in my earlier years when I was in my uh, 20s and 30s. I traveled um, probably 30 times to California on various business trips and had uh, lots of options, lots of opportunity to send presented to me. And a lot of those I did not handle very well. I uh, responded in ways that made the other people feel like I was better than them or that I was holier, that, that somehow I was, uh, uh, you know, a goody two-shoes. And I, you know, I learned that the best way to respond when somebody presents you with a temptation that you, you know you've got to say no to is, is to, say, to say it in a way that puts your decision back on what matters most to you, your relationship with the Lord. I've had times where I've said, you know what, um, I can't do that. And um, that comes across and is received so much better than saying, I won't do that. And so just a little tip on if, if there's uh, things where you're being tempted, situations where you wish you could get out of them, sometimes just choosing the right words can be the difference um, maker between damaging the relationship with the person that you're trying to befriend and at the same time um, uh, honoring God uh, in the midst of your decisions. Let's go on and read uh, verse 11. Uh, It says, On one of these days he came to the house to do his work, and none of the household servants happened to be there. She grabbed him by his coat and said, Sleep with me! He left his coat in her hand and ran out of the house. When she realized that he had left his coat in her hand and ran outside, she called to her house servants, Look, this Hebrew, he shows up before you know it and he's trying to seduce us. He tried to make love to me, but I yelled as loud as I could. With all my yelling and screaming, he left his coat beside me here and he ran outside. She kept his coat right there until his master, her husband, came home. She told him the same story. She said, The Hebrew slave, the one that you brought to us, he came after me and he tried to use me for his plaything. When I yelled and screamed, he left his coat with me and he ran outside. When his master heard his wife's story, telling him, these are the things your slave did to me, he was furious. Joseph's master took him and threw him into the jail where the king's prisoners were locked up. But there in jail, God was still with Joseph. He reached out in kindness to him and put him on good terms with the head jailer. The head jailer put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners, and he ended up managing the whole operation. Wow. Okay, now now the truth is this story is sounding more like a modern movie again. Potiphar's wife gets embarrassed and uh, is mad at Joseph that he rejected her, so she lies to get him in trouble. Then he gets thrown in jail. How many of you, how many of us would say, can my life get any worse? I was the 
personal assistant to one of Pharaoh's right-hand men, and now a total, uh, total lie gets told about me just because I tried to do the right thing and I'm in jail. You know, I've had times when I felt that way. I told you about one of them last week where I thought I'd had a terrible thing done to me that was very unfair, and I was angry for three weeks, angry enough that I was screaming at God in my prayer time. But let me repeat what I said last week. If you're suffering, struggling, angry, pour it all out to God. Tell him all about it. He already knows, but there's something, and you might, you might think it's just words, but there's something that happens when you bear your soul to him. You can't see it, but his spirit does something in your spirit when you do that. Let me tell you another story about where I chose a path similar to Joseph. Um, this was probably 10, 15 years ago. Uh, I, I had gotten uh, laid off from a job that I was on and I was looking for other work. Uh, most of you know I work from home and I've done that for a long time and was really having problems finding work and ended up uh, uh, getting a, a contract job working at um, uh, Delphi in Kokomo, uh, working on a radio project. And I showed up there for the first day of work and was excited and uh, met the guy that I was going to be working for. And uh, that first day, in fact, in the first uh, time that I met him, he said to me, you are my worst nightmare. You are a total waste of my time. I wish you weren't here. Wow. Uh, what a way to uh, let the air out of that uh, uh, balloon. <laughs> um the rest of that day did not go as expected. Um, there was an area of the building where all the other software engineers got to work, and I didn't even get to sit with them. They put me down in a lab um, and uh, put me at a desk uh, that I had to clean all the junk off of and, and gave me a really old uh, chair that was terribly uncomfortable and uh, an old computer, not really the best of technology to work on, and... Uh, basically said, sit down here, we'll see if we can find you some things to do. And uh, honestly, after that first day, I thought, what did I get myself into? And uh, I remember very sincerely uh, bringing this to the Lord and saying, Lord, uh, I don't know what to do here, um, but, I, but I do sincerely want to honor you. Um, you know, uh, there was a part of me that thought, man, I should fight for my rights here. I, I, I should have a seat with the rest of the software guys, a desk with a, a normal computer. I, I need to have better working conditions. And, and Larry needs to apologize to me. That was the guy's name I was working for. Um, there, he shouldn't treat new people like that. But I decided, I'm, and I know the Lord helped me to do this, so I, I, I don't take credit uh, for this decision on my own. I decided, though, that um, I was going to do my best regardless of the circumstances. And so the next day, I actually came back and I asked Larry, what was one job that he had to do that he hated, um, that other people hated, that I could do for him um, that would make his job easier? And so he he told me about this one job that uh, they'd been doing for about a year and a half. And and it was super boring, and it took about a day to do, and it had to be done every two weeks. And some guys tried to write some software to make it easier about a year and a half ago, but the software broke, and it wasn't working anymore, and it was just, it was a job everybody hated. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And so I took that job, and I spent, uh, I don't know, uh, probably a week or two, uh, totally working to understand what the job was uh, and learned the software that these guys had written uh, to automate the job and ended up fixing it so that nobody had to do the job anymore. And uh, uh, so after a week or two, I don't remember how long it was, came back to Larry and I said, hey, uh, I fixed it. And I think I just literally shocked him. Um, because it was the same day that he invited me, found a desk for me up in the software area, and uh, uh, gave me uh, some more tasks to work on. And he and I ended up becoming really good friends. And 
uh, spending a lot of time together. We're still good friends, talk regularly. And uh, I know that that was because I chose to do my best in spite of the circumstances. I sincerely wanted to honor God in, in, in the midst of what seemed like an unfair situation. So I know from personal experience that this, this path, this way of, of choosing, um, uh, that it works. Let's go back to the end of the story here with Joseph. Verse 23 of Genesis 39, it says, The head jailer gave Joseph free reign. He never even checked on him because God was with him. Whatever he did, God made sure it worked out for the best. Notice how it ends there. God made sure that it worked out for the best. Oh, friends, this is true. This is true stuff. Very often, it's not right away. It's not like you say, okay, God, I want to honor you, and he flips a switch, and the next day is wonderful. Sometimes you've got to be a slave. You've got to be stuck in jail. You've got to uh, walk through hard stuff. Uh, but God always follows through. God always keeps his promises. He is faithful. No matter what your circumstance is today, you know, I know, I know a lot of you are struggling with uh, the e-learning and all of the challenges associated with coronavirus, uh, but I encourage you to choose just like Joseph did. Our verse uh, to memorize this week is John 15:5. And uh, if you're learning the long versions, it's John 15, 5 through 8. Um, if you are learning the verses and you've not heard from me, please reach out. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I'll uh, hopefully see you soon. If not, you'll hear from me next week. Take care.